Chlorophyll is arguably one of the most important molecules in the world, and so I felt it only fair to see what kind of chemistry I could do with it. Naturally, the first thing I decided to do was to try and isolate some fairly pure chlorophyll, and to get started I went ahead and blended some spinach leaves in isopropyl alcohol. The idea here is that chlorophylls are not very polar molecules, and so they don't dissolve very well in water. Isopropyl is still fairly polar, but it's cheap and it should be non-polar enough to extract a pretty decent quantity of chlorophyll. After I had blended them together for a few seconds, I went ahead and passed the alcoholic spinach slurry through a coffee filter to try and remove as much plant material as I could. Once this was done, I took my crude chlorophyll extract and decided to shine some UV light through it. I've heard for years that chlorophyll fluoresces red under UV light, and as you can see here, that is 100% true. I'll come back to this later in the video, but for now, I wanted to dry off the isopropyl along with any water that might have been extracted to isolate my crude chlorophyll. After allowing the alcohol to dry overnight, I was left with a gummy residue of chlorophyll that also contained any lipids and resins that were present in the spinach. Since chlorophyll is far more soluble in organic solvents than these other contaminants likely were, I decided to try further purifying my chlorophyll by resuspending it in a minimal amount of solvent. For this step, I wanted to try using two different solvents because I was curious which would work better for selectively and effectively dissolving chlorophyll. To this end, I scraped out as much resin as I could and then transferred it to a small beaker. I tried my best to dissolve it using 30 milliliters of diethyl ether and constant stirring, and this was then poured into two 15 milliliter centrifuge tubes. I then repeated this process on the remaining resin, this time with absolute ethanol. The four centrifuge tubes were next placed across from each other in a centrifuge and spun at 4,200 RPM for five minutes. The purpose of this step was to separate out any insoluble resin or particulate plant material that I might have picked up in the previous step. As a side note, depending on how I decide to upload these next few videos, this might be the first video where I demonstrate the centrifuge. For those who don't know, centrifuges are common pieces of laboratory equipment, particularly in biochemical and medical laboratories. These devices work by spinning samples extremely fast, which separates the components of a heterogeneous mixture by density, forcing denser materials to the bottom where they collect in a pellet. If you've ever had blood taken, the vial was almost certainly put into one of these to separate the cellular material from plasma. Aside from the fact that they're kind of expensive if you're doing this as a hobby, they're very simple to use, and the only thing you need to always remember is to make sure the tubes are balanced, as an imbalanced centrifuge may catastrophically fail. Anyway, after this process was over, I went ahead and transferred one of the ether samples to a vial for storage, and the other into a glass petri dish to dry. Both of the ethanol samples were transferred to a separate petri dish, and if you check out the pellets at the bottom of the four centrifuge tubes, you can see that the ethanol left behind pale green, almost white pellets, while the ether left behind smaller dark green pellets. After leaving both petri dishes out overnight under a fan, this is what I had left. On the right, you can see my ether extract dish, and the way boat in front of it is everything remaining in the beaker that had refused to dissolve in the ether. On the left is my dried ethanol extract, along with a way boat containing everything that refused to dissolve in the ethanol. As you can very clearly see, ether did an immensely better job at dissolving chlorophyll, both quantitatively and selectively. The chlorophyll left behind when ether had evaporated was not all oily and had a very uniform color. It was also a visibly larger quantity despite half of the ether extract going into storage. The ethanol extract on the other hand was greasy, never actually looking completely dry. It also had a reddish tone under the darker green, and the quantity was pretty bad especially considering this represents twice as much ethanol extract. Looking briefly at what wasn't dissolved, the resin left behind by the ether had a consistency like honey while the resin left behind by the ethanol had a much tougher consistency that nearly broke apart when I agitated it. This is only a guess because I don't really know anything about chlorophyll and its solubility, but my thinking is that both solvents probably left behind the majority of the residual cellular material, but the ether left behind a broader spectrum of lipids as well. With all of this taken into consideration, I'd say that ether is very obviously a better solvent for chlorophyll than alcohol, but I do have another test for that later on. For now I want to go back to the fluorescence of chlorophyll now that I had a reasonably pure sample. And to this end, I went ahead and threw away the ethanol extract and scraped as much of the ether extract as I could into a vial for storage. I then dissolved the remaining chlorophyll in some mineral oil and transferred it to a test tube. 
I put some excess mineral oil in another test tube and then set it up above my UV light. The next few minutes are just footage I got while playing around with fluorescence, so if you'd like to skip this, feel free. If not, just sit back and enjoy.
So that was fun, but now I wanted to do another test to get a better feel for the solubility of chlorophylls in different organic solvents. To this end, I decided to do a basic paper chromatography test, which is something I do from time to time, but realized I've never actually demonstrated on this channel. Chromatography refers to a variety of techniques used to separate mixtures of organic compounds or even biological molecules like proteins based on differences in their chemical or physical properties. This is done using a stationary phase, which is the material a sample passes through, and a mobile phase, which is a liquid or gas carrying the sample through the stationary phase. In this case, I'm using some filter papers I cut apart as my stationary phase, and my mobile phase is four different solvents I wanted to test. The first thing I needed to do was affix my sample to the stationary phase, which I do by saturating one end of these strips of paper with some chlorophyll dissolved in ether from earlier. After they dry, I add a bit of solvent to the bottom of a small beaker, place my strip of paper into the beaker chlorophyll side down, and cover the beaker with a watch glass. Over time, the solvent will be pulled up through the paper through capillary action and carry the chlorophyll along with it. The better the chlorophyll keeps up with the solvent front, the better the solvent is at dissolving chlorophyll. And this is because this type of chromatography takes advantage of the difference in the sample's affinity for the mobile phase versus its affinity for the stationary phase. This first solvent was ethyl acetate, which, as you can see, did an excellent job of pulling the chlorophyll through the paper, making it an excellent solvent for chlorophyll. The second solvent I tried was diethyl ether, and by the looks of it, did similarly as well as ethyl acetate. Both ethyl acetate and diethyl ether are nonpolar solvents, with ether being considerably more nonpolar. Third, I tried ethanol, and this was considerably slower given the much lower vapor pressure of ethanol relative to something like diethyl ether. Ethanol is a fairly polar solvent, being more polar than isopropyl, but less polar than methanol. As you can see here, the ethanol was actually doing a fine job pulling the chlorophyll through, but something dark orange and nearly red was being left behind. This made me realize I was forgetting a whole other class of compounds I had been extracting all along the way, carotenoids. Carotenoids are even more nonpolar than chlorophylls, and are thus less attracted to the more polar ethanol mobile phase. This held true for my last trial using isopropyl, which got a little funky so I stopped it early. From this little trial, I found that even though something more nonpolar like ether or ethyl acetate is better at separating chlorophyll from some of the more resinous crap earlier, and better at dissolving chlorophylls in general, alcohol seems to dissolve chlorophyll better than it dissolves carotenoids. And with this in mind, I would likely try to use alcohol over ether if I for some reason wanted to purify this even further. To wrap up my little batch of experiments with chlorophyll, I thought it would be fun to demonstrate the mechanism of action chlorophyll uses to produce oxygen and energy from sunlight. This process is called photosynthesis, and if you don't know what that is, you probably didn't click on this video in the first place, so I'm not going to really explain it any further. Photosynthesis takes place in structures called thylakoid, and these are found in chloroplasts. These thylakoid are absolutely saturated in chlorophyll, and here chlorophyll serves two functions to absorb energy from sunlight, and to then use that energy from sunlight to facilitate the reaction converting carbon dioxide and water into glucose and oxygen. To demonstrate this reaction, I first add some water and a touch of soap to two beakers. I then add a small amount of sodium bicarbonate to one of the beakers and set the other aside. Next, I use a hole punch to cut several little discs out of the spinach leaves from earlier and set them aside as well. After I finish my leaf discs, I take a clean syringe and remove the plunger. Next, I transfer some of the leaf discs into the back of the syringe, followed by a few milliliters of the sodium bicarbonate free water. The plunger is replaced, and after purging the excess air from the syringe, I cover the opening with my finger and pull back hard on the plunger. This creates a vacuum that immediately pulls any dissolved air out of the leaf discs. Once I release the plunger, some of the excess water replaces the air that was lost by the leaf discs, so now they sink in water. The syringe is then set aside, and I repeat the process with the sodium bicarbonate infused water before transferring both samples of leaf discs to their respective beakers. Now I simply wait, and within a few minutes, the leaf discs and the sodium bicarbonate water begin to flow to the surface, while the discs in the water beaker never move no matter how long I wait. This is because the leaf discs in the bicarbonate water have access to all the ingredients for photosynthesis, 
water, light, and carbon dioxide, while the leaf discs in the water beaker only have access to light and water. As a result, the leaf discs in the bicarbonate beaker undergo rigorous photosynthesis, which generates not only the target glucose, but also oxygen gas, which causes them to gain buoyancy and float to the surface. As a side note, this strategy can also be used to help flower cuttings live a lot longer. In any case, that's all I have for today. I hope you found this video interesting, and as always, I want to thank all my incredible patrons for their generous contributions. Your support is vital and very appreciated. And to everyone else, if you'd like to see more content like this, consider subscribing on TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, or even by becoming a patron yourself. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.